So today we will present actually a, a new product that Galerie just announced this morning, actually. And so we are very proud to, to present this product and your first one uh, uh, who are actually exposed to this new product officially. And, and this new product you will see, I mean, is a, 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 what we believe a very interesting solution to unleash the NVMe SSD capabilities uh, for, uh, for the data centers, basically. So in terms of, uh, uh, I'm sure that you, you got the abstract, but I would like to go through the presenter, right? And, and, and Fred or Lisa, do you want me to do it? Or do you want you to, to go through the, through the assembly? Or shall I do yes, please. If you okay. can do it. Okay, so I will, so, so I'm just introducing myself. So I'm a basis, I'm running Calgary and I will of course introduce to you Calgary in a couple of minutes. Uh, prior to that, I've got a lot of experience in semiconductor industry and, and telecom. Uh, I spent 10 years at TI. I also founded my own company back in the 2000s that I sold to Alcatelus in 2010. I spent a few years in the Bay Area, uh, a great experience. And then I, I took over the role of CEO of Calgary uh, about seven years ago. So with me in, in my team and what we have today, so we have the pleasure to have also Sebastian. Sebastian Leduc is our software engineer and director. Sebastian, do you want to introduce yourself? Hello, good, good morning, everybody. So I'm Sebastian. So I joined Calare two years and a half ago. Uh, before that, <laughs> I spent uh, around 20 years in the uh, uh, semiconductor industry, uh, basically at uh, ST Microelectronics and also ST Ericsson, uh, managing some uh, uh, software development teams, basically. Thank you, Sebastian. The next one in the order of the presentation will be Loic. Loic? Yeah, so uh, good morning or good afternoon, everybody. My name is Loïc Camo. It's a pleasure to be here. So I joined the Carrier about three years and a half ago, and I'm uh, in charge of strategic marketing. And I spent all my career in the semiconductor industry in large and small companies. Thank you, Loïc. Jeff? Hello. Um, good morning, good afternoon. Um, Jean-François Marie, um, I, I recognize some, some names here. So I've been in, in the storage industry for more than 30 years. <clears throat> I'm chief solution architect here at Carre. Um, and before that, I got some the various roles at companies like Sun Microsystems, EMC, and NetApp. Um, and for the five past years, uh, I was manag managing analyst relationship as well as I was director for product in solution in email. So that's why I know a bunch of you guys. So happy to be there. Thank you, Jeff. Amy? Yeah, so I'm uh, Remy Goguet. I'm senior software architect at Calway for the data center business unit. I have more than 25 years experience in the semiconductor industry, especially for uh, uh, real-time operating system and voice over IP and packet processing. And I spent also seven years in the research lab in CEA in France, in the Grenoble area, working on uh, virtualization technologies. <clears throat> okay, thank you, Amy. So today, as I, as I introduce, uh, we are uh, going to present our new product. This new product is a new smart storage card. Uh, it is called K200 LP. And, uh, uh, and of course, we will go into the detail, we dig into this product and, and share with you a couple of use cases and uh, ongoing uh, product that we're developing with our customers. So in terms of agenda, what I would like to go through with my team is first, of course, to introduce Kali. Uh, then I will let Sebastian explain why we believe DPUs and acceleration cards are, are very, very important and are revolutionizing uh, the, the, the storage uh, in data centers. Loic will share with you our views in terms of a market for these type of acceleration cards. And, and then we will focus on two use cases uh, targeting storage. Uh, the first, one, first use case actually will show you a, a video uh, which exposing a, a concrete product, a storage array product based on our smart storage card. So you will see a video showing the hardware, showing the software and so on. And then we will present you uh, uh, this use case, so the, uh, the storage array. And then we will also introduce another use case uh, using our smart storage adapter uh, for improvement of storage virtualization. And uh, we will actually share with you a first example uh, in the Xen environment. Of course, during all of this presentation, feel free to interrupt us, feel free to chat, and, and we will either answer to the chat or, I mean, we will uh, interrupt the presenter and, uh, and answer directly to your question. Okay. 
But let me introduce you, Kelly. So uh, Kelly actually is uh, uh, is really a very good example of, of deep tech company. So uh, Kelly has been created about 10 years ago. We are a spin-off of a very well-known large research lab in France called CEA. And, and we are actually a, a, a semiconductor company. Uh, our DNA has been developing a new type of processor. And this type of processor has been completely re-architectured in order to address a new issue, which is how to crunch data as fast as possible in a very, very uh, efficient way. So you will see, I mean, we are at the heart of a new market, which is a booming market, which is about edge computing and about fast data processing. And of course, what we develop, what we've been developing for the last 10 years is extremely relevant uh, for storage. And that's what we're gonna discuss today. In terms of company size, so we are about 100 people. We mainly base uh, our headquarters are in Grenoble in the middle of France. We've got a small office in US, small office in Japan. Uh, we have today, what we will present to you is our DPU and our cars. So the DPU is the third generation of our processor. So very mature technology. Uh, we raised so far about 100 million euro and actually we are a listed company. So we listed the company two years ago. We are on, on, the, on the marketplace uh, uh, Euronext. Also a word about some of our investors. Uh, so we, uh, we have very large corporation as our shareholders, including NXP, uh, who is uh, one of our shareholders. But we have also, for example, the car maker Renault Nissan Mitsubishi, because of course, this type of technology is also very, very interesting for our next generation of car, as well as over large, uh, uh, both uh, corporate and financial organizations. So just to, I mean, uh, to, to make it clear the, about the positioning of Cali, what we see is that in our modern societies, uh, uh, we, uh, as a society, generate more and more data. Okay? So the, the data exploding, especially due to AI, type of technology, 5G, IoT, SSDs, and so on. It happens that out of this data, only 25% is reusable when you store the data. Most of it is ephemeral, which means that you need to analyze this data on the fly and to react immediately. And that's exactly uh, our positioning. And that's act exactly the vision of Kali, really our vision is to transform raw data into meaningful data. Okay. And this is what we do thanks to our generation of processor. This is a very, very different market from the traditional processor market. And we see that as the third wave in the semiconductor industry. The first one, of course, was the, the processor for computer. And Intel is, of course, obviously uh, leading uh, this market. Uh, the second one, the second wave has been smartphone with a completely different type of uh, processor, uh, more addressing connectivity and mobility and power consumption issues. And here, Intel is actually uh, not leading at all the rest of this, of, of all the leader, you know them, uh, they're well known, the Qualcomm, the Samsung, and, and, and based on the ARM processor. And we believe we are really at the beginning of the new market that we call intelligent system, so this market where you need processor to analyze a huge flow of data very, very fast. And this is very interesting because you will see if we take the example of storage, we are exactly uh, in, in this situation, in the sense that there are traditional approaches, for example, using x86 or ARM type of processor. But we believe that with the introduction of new technologies such as NVMe SSDs, these architectures are not relevant today any longer. And you need to provide a new approach to manage this huge flow of data very fast. It happened that these uh, uh, needs in terms of new type of processor uh, for edge computing and for very fast data crunching uh, is a uh, global, global need. And it's very complementary to, of course, an x86 or an ARM core. You, you, of course, in data centers, but also in car, in aerospace, in industry 2.0, in 5G, you will see our good examples. So we are really in the, at the heart of, 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 a new, uh, of a new industry in the semiconductor industry. There is a question. That was based on the slides I was looking at. Um, uh, and if one makes decisions based on ephemeral data, which is what you seem to be saying uh, on your presentation, um, how do you then validate those decisions if somebody complains about them a couple of months later? Yeah, so it, it's, it's a very good example. And maybe I mean, a, a way to uh, uh, to to put uh, uh, as an image with this example is autonomous car, right? So that's exactly what happened in autonomous car. Uh, a car actually, what is an autonomous car is a car with sensors. These sensors, they generate a huge row flow of data, okay? And then you need to analyze this data very fast, usually running algorithm such as AI, 
And then out of this raw data, you extract information such as, okay, there is a pedestrian crossing, there is a, a sign and so on to take a decision. Okay. So you're right in a sense, is the car actually as an accident? Uh, you will first uh, try to understand what was the information that is at the origin of the accident. At the same time, then you may have to go back to the raw information. And it happens that some of the car makers actually, they, they store this raw information uh, to, uh, to be able to, 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 uh, to go back uh, to this analysis. So it's not the core of the discussion of today, of course, but uh, just to answer your question, this is a, a core issue of the industry. It's not so much the case in the case of storage because you will see in case of storage across all you know, the high availability type of mechanism which are working perfectly. But in terms of more critical systems, then there are definitely, I mean, a lot of things happening in the industry to, to manage that, what you just said. Okay. I guess what I was thinking of that if you make regulated decisions or decisions with a legal con legal application, you might have to take a snapshot of the data you use to make that decision, um, even if you're not keeping all the data that is coming past you. You might want to keep critical data that results in a particular decision that may result in possible legal action. Is that making sense? Yeah, you're right. And then, there are, you know, there are metadata models and so on. And uh, as I told you, you underline a, a critical issue in one of the context of critical systems. So, for example, one of our customers is a, a, a aircraft engine maker. Okay? So you can imagine that, of course, uh, what you say is very relevant, right? Uh, so once again, depending on the, the use case, depending on the market, it's more or less relevant. I would tend to say that, of course, this is uh, Calais is just one player in this industry. Uh, it's an issue which is about critical system edge computing. And, and industry is is putting in place a mechanism, including storage critical data, you know, some safeguards mechanism and so on to address it. But I, I suggest that we move on. Uh, and uh, thanks for this very sorry, but uh, I got another one on the use case that the. Uh, because you present some uh, some kind of use case, but uh, some of your competitors are also uh, going specifically on one around the security. Do you have also the the idea to uh, provide your, uh, your 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 acceleration card on GPU uh, around this use case, around the analysis of uh, of security and data security? Yes. Uh, yes, so let me just go to the next slide and we have a better picture about what we target and what kind of uh, offering we have. So, so maybe just before that, let me just explain, okay, the core technology and I will let Sebastian go into the details, uh, but the main vision uh, of, of Calgary technology is about what is called many core. Okay. So what is many core? I mean, you know that frankly, in the posture of your mobile phone, you have a multi-core, your PC is got a multi-core, which means that you've got a few cores. What we mean by many core is architectures that are capable of running hundreds of cores on the same dial. Okay. This requires a completely different way to structure and architecture your chip. And, and said we'll give you an example with the current chip that we are shipping today. Okay. So for information, so Calre, we patented, we invested massively so that our architecture actually is designed in a way that we can put hundreds of cores as many as we want. Actually, we can put more chip together and, and basically provide an array of processors. And we put in place the mechanism to make sure that we can feed these processor with the data so that the processor are running efficiently. So I will let Seb uh, explain what it means, especially in the use case of storage. But just for information, this is a, a this has been the work of the last 10 years. As I told you, it's a, a spin-off of a silver and a pretty strong investment, uh, but it's very, very powerful technology. And you will see the advantage versus alternatives like FPGA and so on. I will let Seb do that. So, so uh, Jake, will you will you compare your technology with FPGAs and other other you know types of processors later in the presentation? Yes. So I will skip my questions. Okay. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. Don't worry. <laughs> so maybe, and I will I will be uh, very short and will let. Don't worry, uh, Sebastian. Uh, uh, give you more details, but just to explain a little bit what we do with this processor. Basically, we've got two kind of uh, market that we address. So the first one is about next gen uh, embedded system. It's a, a pretty long term, uh, typically, as you may have seen, some of our customers, they are aircraft makers, they are uh, car makers and so on. And what they want is to build uh, uh, next gen critical systems, having a, a need to compute very, very fast a lot of data, okay? And in that case, they use our chip and they build their system. And then this is what we're gonna uh, focus on today. Uh, we have another market, which is much shorter term since we are 
uh, pushing product on the market right now, which is about next generation data center. Uh, and that's a market that Loic will explain. Uh, and for this market, we provide what we call acceleration cards. Okay, so PC, PCI acceleration cards that you can plug into startup servers. Uh, and we have a complete software environment that we can adapt depending on the use case. And there again, I will let uh, Sebastian, the team, give you all the details. But just to give you a high level- hey, Can I just ask one question here? Do you actually build the cards yourself or do you take an ARM-like model where you design them or you let people co-design them with you and then they manufacture them? <laughs> what's, what's the process behind your cards? Okay, so let me uh, answer the question for both the card and the chip, because usually, I mean, the two questions are, are very much uh, uh, related. So we are a fabless company. So, you know, traditional model, NVIDIA is a fabless company, Apple is a fabless company, which means that we design chip, we design the card, but we don't manufacture them. Okay. In terms of manufacturing, uh, we uh, have a partnership with TSMC, okay, so the larger uh, founder in the world. Okay, so our chip is actually manufactured by TSMC. It's a 60 nanometer. And in terms of cards, so we have a, a partnership with Wistron. So Wistron is one of the larger CMS, EMS in the world, uh, based in Taiwan. And, and actually, um, that's part of it. Announcement we made today actually so this K200 LP. Uh, so we have set up all the production line with Wisdom, so we are ready for volume production. What we mean by volume production is a few thousand of cards per, per month, or even more. Okay, and so in terms of uh, use cases, what you can do, what you can offload, or what you can run on top of this card. Once again, the point is not to replace an XATC or an ARM core, it's not to, to run the main application in the data center, but it's really to to uh, uh, be at the center of data analysis and to offload when needed uh, this task from the main CPU. And we have basically four use cases. Uh, one is storage, and that's the one we will focus on today. Uh, second is security, of course. Uh, you mentioned security. Security is very demanding in terms of uh, this type of uh, uh, compute workload. And then we have also, and that's pretty unique, and we will explain that to you, we have the capability also to run mathematical functions like a GPU, okay, including AI on the same chip using the same technology, as well as all the SDN type of acceleration like open the switch and so on. Okay. So you have in front of you a, a very generic fully programmable card that you can program with C and C and Seb will explain that to you, that really address this need to crunch data very, very fast and very efficiently. And of course, that's very relevant uh, for the storage industry. And that's what we are going to focus in, in, in the next hour. Can I just ask a further question here on this yes, you know, programmable card? Who's doing the programming for each of these functions? Are you relying on the software engineers creating the software that's running at a high level? Or are you looking at some micro architects who actually design accelerators you know, between the application and the card? OK, so we provide a lot of software from ourselves. Okay. Uh, actually, you can run this card, and uh, Sebastian will explain, in like a standard C or C++ uh, type of processor, that you can run Linux, for example. And so we provide, of course, the Linux, we provide the libraries, we provide also you know, plug-in to comp traditional compiler like uh, GTP. And, and so we have two types of customers. One type of customer, they are expecting a kind of black box solution. Okay, And you will see in the case of uh, storage appliance, for example, uh, most of our customers, they expect uh, something which is pretty complete and nearly final product. In that case, we have designed, we have coded with some of our partners the complete solution. We have tested it and we provide it along with our card. Okay. And then we have some use cases where our customers they want the basic framework, they want to have the dev kit, and then they have the capability to develop their own system. And of course, in the middle, we have a, a possibility, depending on the use case and the customers, to be black or white and to have a kind of gray model where the customer they can leverage as much as possible what we have. Uh, but also customize and add their own function. And really our approach has always been to expose standard API to use open source code, open tools, so that that's very easy and, and our customer they can reuse the legacy code. Okay. Okay, yes. so yes, so, so we are, for, for, to answer your question, yes, I mean, uh, uh, we indeed, we can do much more than storage and, and uh, I think when said we have go through, I went through his presentation, you will better understand. Sebastian, I think that the audience is really uh, waiting for your presentation. Okay, let's go. So in the next section, I'm gonna talk about uh, DPUs. So as you have seen in, in the press these days, DPUs are a kind of buzzword those days. 
it's kind of funny because at Carray, I think we kind of uh, invented the DPU because our processor basically uh, is a DPU and is, its architecture uh, has been uh, uh, imagined or invented uh, almost five years ago. So probably before the word DPU even existed. Uh, so let's try to define what makes a DPU. Uh, so uh, basically in the data center world, uh, a DPU is basically a new class of programmable processor, which is specialized in running data center infrastructure services. Uh, actually, this definition is, uh, uh, I think, quite quite nice. And uh, if you look at Intel today, I think they even uh, rebranded it to uh, uh, IPU for infrastructure processing units. Uh, so yeah, really, the idea is to move the infrastructure uh, processing from the x86 in the data center to the DPU. So uh, then uh, the, the aim or, uh, is, is that it, it becomes a third socket in data centers. So basically alongside the CPU and GPU. And uh, uh, to, to be able to do that, it needs to have uh, some uh, uh, accelerated software defined services uh, for all kinds of data center infrastructure, uh, basically networking, storage, and security. So next slide, thanks. So if you look at the key features of a DPU, uh, I think the, the key point is that it has to be fully programmable. So basically uh, the management plane, the control plane and the data plane must be fully programmable so that it's, it, it can really adapt to new protocols uh, in the future uh, without having to wait for the next generation of uh, uh, SOC basically. It has to be, of course, high performance, uh, and it has to uh, support high performance PCIe interface uh, with, of course, uh, support for virtualization, so with SRIOV. Uh, in terms of networking, it has to have uh, high performance network interfaces with packet passing, matching, and dispatching accelerated in hardware. Uh, it has to support RDMA accelerated in hardware as well, and some, of course, some TCP acceleration, so some TCP offloads, I would say, so like RSS, LRO, or checksums. Then, uh, in order to sustain some, uh, uh, let's say, more advanced services, um, some tightly coupled inline accelerators are uh, usually required. So, you, for example, for uh, crypto. Uh, it's quite difficult to sustain uh, line rate with just software. So uh, it's always better to have some inline accelerators uh, for crypto, same for compression, although it can be done in software, uh, it's better if, if you have some uh, compression hardware. And uh, for storage, again, uh, erasure coding is definitely something that uh, can be quite useful to accelerate because it's pretty uh, compute intensive. Uh, and then, oh, sorry, there was a question in the chat, but Jean-Francois is far too quick for me, and he's already replying in the chat. Sorry to interrupt, Sebastian, go ahead. I think you'd switch a bit too, too fast, uh, Eric, just it also needs some security features, but anyway, okay. let, you can... Let me, let me go back. <laughs> yeah, just some security features are also key in the data center, because data centers are now multi-tenants. And uh, uh, to, uh, to allow that, you need security features. So of course, a root of trust and some secure boot and secure firmware upgrade upgrades. So next slide, please. Uh, so uh, as I said, uh, the MPPA, Calare MPPA processor is uh, uh, basically what we believe is the most advanced DPU on the market. Uh, it's the results of 10 years of development. And compared to other uh, DPUs that are today available, uh, it's quite different. So on the left, you have the usual approach where basically, uh, let's say most uh, Semico vendors have uh, uh, put in the same SOC uh, some, uh, let's say, uh, NIC uh, ASIC, uh, so hardwired uh, data plane, I would say, and they have put uh, a few uh, power hungry uh, ARM cores usually uh, in the same SOC uh, to give some programmability. So this is, this is okay, but then what we see is that in practice, uh, as soon as you need to uh, offload some data plane on the CPU cores, the performance is usually uh, quite uh, go down quite quickly. Excuse me, Sebastian, but did you define ARM cores uh, power hungry? Because usually for the rest of the industry, ARM is a synonym of uh, you know, power efficiency. 
Yeah, that's correct. But I think that's maybe more on the mobile side. Uh, at least that's my, my understanding. Uh, I think now uh, I agree that compared to x86, the, the ARM cores are, of course, low power. But uh, I would say compared to the uh, smaller cores like ours, uh, there is still quite a difference in terms of power consumption. Yeah, th does it mean that your power core is also uh, more efficient from the you know computational aspect because you know we have also to compare the, the cpu efficiency both on you know uh, power and uh, uh, and uh, cpu capabilities yeah you're right so in uh, in the next slide i think we have some comparisons uh in terms of uh uh, let's say what we have kind of new KPI, uh, which is uh, uh, myops per dollar and per watt. And you will see that uh, uh, with our solution, we believe the, uh, we, we have a pretty good solution. Yeah, so may, uh, maybe like you said, we can share with the audience a concrete example. I mean, if you, if you take the uh, uh, car based on Bluefield, okay, you certainly know I mean, uh, uh, what the power consumption it is. And usually it's about, it's, uh, eight ARM cores or 16 ARM cores, okay, depending which group you use. If you compare with our chip, which is 80 cores, and Sebastian will explain further, which is these are our own cores that we designed, which are indeed much more efficient than ARM core, especially A72. Uh, uh, then uh, you can see that the chip itself, the typical power is 20 watt. Okay, and the card is 30 watt. So you have a, uh, an order of two to five versus what you can find uh, uh, on the market. So uh, huge power efficiency. It's based on the core, but it's based also on the architecture of the chip, which is also extremely efficient. But I let, I let Seb explain how it works. Thank you, Eric. So did, did that answer your question? No, not yet. I mean, uh, you know, I want to be sure that we are comparing uh, Apple with Apple C here, but uh, I, I'm not sure yet. So I will. Okay, okay. I understand. Thing. Sorry to interrupt. Can I just uh, remind the Calray um, uh, execs on the chat to check that you are indeed replying to everyone when you reply to messages? Because I am getting a lot of replies to questions by the audience into my direct feed. Um, I don't want to start copying and pasting because it would make it very confusing. So if you can ask to make sure that before you reply, you check who you are replying to, that would be helpful because there are a couple of questions there that need answering. Thank you. Okay, thanks. So I will resume with the, uh, the right part of the slide. So uh, on this uh, picture, you have a, a very high level presentation of our Calray MPPS3 Coolidge, which is the third generation of uh, uh, Calray DPU. Uh, so it's based on the many core architecture. So it features 80, uh, VLIW CPU cores that are gathered in uh, five clusters. So each cluster has uh, 16 cores. Uh, and they, the, the chip runs at uh, one gigahertz. Uh, of course, it has some uh, high speed interfaces. So in terms of uh, uh, Ethernet, we have two 100 gigabits per second uh, Ethernet interfaces. Uh, we support PCI Gen 4 uh, 16 lanes and uh, DDR4. So this is uh, for uh, high-speed interfaces. Uh, in terms of power efficiency uh, on storage use cases, uh, what we measure today is uh, 20 watt uh, power consumption, uh, typical consumption on, uh, let's say, uh, NVMe over fabric uh, target controller use case, for example, uh, which is we believe is pretty good. Uh, it's fully programmable. So again, that's a major difference with the us usual approach uh, because we have uh, 80 cores and each core can be uh, programmed. Uh, it, it makes everything programmable. So the control plane, the management plane uh, run usually on one cluster running a, st a standard Linux. So uh, which makes it quite easy to port uh, any uh, management plane or control plane uh, framework uh, to our DPU. And then uh, for the data plane, we have we, we use the 60, sorry, 64 remaining cores uh, and we run SPDK, uh, 
uh, on those uh, 64 cores. So basically, just to answer the question you had on uh, um, porting code on, uh, on our DPU, so based on SPDK, it makes it very standard to program. And you can just basically uh, implement whatever storage service you want on x86 SPDK first, and then port it uh, very easily to our data plane. Uh, so it, it really uh, enables a very smooth uh, uh, offloading of storage services. And of course, uh, we have a standard tool chain and software frameworks uh, that are, uh, uh, well, we, we try to use uh, everything as standard as possible, uh, be it on the framework side or, or on the toolchain side, so that it's very uh, easy for uh, people and programmers to uh, ramp up on our architecture. Uh, I've got one question, sorry, Sebastian. Uh, Bertrand Garret, the informaticien in Paris. Uh, in fact, uh, do you have the plan to, uh, to provide your own storage or your own uh, appliances with your own DPU and cards or do you have or, or who are your customers today in this in this storage space it's what yeah so, so, we, uh, who? so who they are okay uh, so basically today we are working with some uh, partners uh, who are building some storage appliance with our card uh, so basically it's a co-development uh, the, the customers, the end customer are then the end customers of those partners who are building the storage appliances. And uh, we have some uh, POCs uh, ongoing already and a few more coming in the, uh, in the coming months. Uh, so basically, uh, the storage appliance product should be announced pretty soon. And we will thank you for the detail. precision. We will go into the details. You will see a video actually of this product. So, uh, so Sebastian, maybe uh, we, we need to uh, uh, to, to accelerate a bit. Okay. To rapidly share maybe a high level view about the different. Yeah. So, so in... Sebastian, on on that level with the storage appliance folks that you're dealing with, what use cases are you looking at with them? Oh, uh, sorry. <clears throat> with the Sebastian, it takes a while to get from Boulder. Colorado, <laughs> sorry. With the with the storage appliances, what are you? Um, what use cases are you focused on with them? So basically, it's either. I think we have uh, a few slides after uh, yeah. talking yeah, about that. We should go to the next slide because that Thank you. that we we'll yeah that's covered to, basically. To your question. We will see can uh, I, all the product and so. Can I just say there is a question from Hartmut Fear, um, asking to name the partners, please. So in terms of name of partners, so uh, one of, uh, I mean, of course, uh, especially uh, we have, of course, as you understand, NDA in place, but one of them has been officially announced with Wistron, that you may know. And then uh, we are also working with 2CSI. Uh, and and um, uh, we have, as mentioned, Sebastian, we have uh, about a half a dozen of additional customer and partners we work with to build this new type of storage appliance that we will introduce later, but the, we cannot share the names. You should know very soon, some of them. Okay. Um, another question, this is from Brian Beck, uh, analyst Brian Beck at Freeform Dynamics. So you simplify the cores by dropping many of those general purpose features, yet still get efficient mass execution of concurrent and heterogeneous critical tasks. That's interesting. Oh, yeah. And Jamie just replied. Yeah, actually, just to elaborate a bit, I think the the storage use cases are very parallel uh, in nature because basically uh, you end up having to process many uh, uh, connections in parallel. So this is something that uh, uh, maps very well to a mini core architecture. So yes, I think the answer is yes, and what you said is correct, and and I hope I gave more details. Yep. Uh, uh, so just uh, another one, a small one. Uh, if they are, if the, the DPU or the card is programmable, can I dedicate one cluster of cores to a dedicated tasks independent to another task in the other clusters? Definitely you can, yes. Yeah, that's 
that's uh, uh, one one key strength of our architecture. So that's what we are doing, and you will see some details of the software architecture for storage, where we have uh, the control plane running on one cluster, and the four other clusters running the data plane. So that's all already some kind of uh, a very different uh, kind of tasks. But you can go even further away and have uh, some one cluster running some OpenCL uh, AI acceleration, for example. So that's the key strength of our architecture, I think. Thank you for the precision. So here you have a diagram uh, summarizing the, the key uh, strengths of a DPU versus over other kinds of uh, uh, architectures, so FPGA, GPU, and x86. Uh, as you can see, uh, uh, we believe that the DPU is a very good compromise uh, and, let's say, is uh, very good in, in most of the topics that are listed here, so computing, power efficiency, uh, programmability. Uh, concurrent execution. So again, the parallelism fits very well the data center uh, use cases because it's connection based. So uh, we, we have the low latency and deterministic slash real time characteristics of our uh, chip. As I said, you can run very different kind of tasks on different clusters with uh, little to, to no interaction uh, between the two, between the tasks, sorry. And also in terms of performance scalability, uh, we, we have a model where we have scalability within DAI. We also support uh, or plan to support DAI to DAI with uh, uh, several uh, DAIs in the same package. And you can also have, of course, scalability using several chips on the same board. So that's not the topic of today because our board so has only one MPPA today, but that's something we are working on. Next slide. So in, in terms of current DPU landscape, uh, so I just tried to list here uh, the uh, DPU uh, products that are available on the market today. So uh, you have the NVIDIA Bluefield 2, which is basically a, a Mellanox product. So uh, as I said uh, in the previous slides, uh, it's an example of uh, uh, octocore ARM CPU uh, plus uh, the Mellanox ConnectX six uh, uh, network interface in the same die. Uh, so it, well, it's two times uh, 100 gigabits per, uh, per second Ethernet, PCI Gen 4 by 16, so quite comparable to us in terms of high-speed interfaces. But uh, in terms of architecture, we believe the, um, well, what we know is that the performance go down when you put too much uh, processing on the ARM cores. Uh, same for Stingray Broadcom. So basically, it's quite similar to the Bluefield in terms of architecture, but it's uh, a Gen 3, PCI Gen 3, and only one uh, 100 gigabit uh, uh, Ethernet interface. Uh, then we've got the Marvel uh, Liquid IO 3, uh, which is quite impressive in terms of number of uh, ARM cores. Uh, I think the, this, um, this NIC is more targeted, I mean, this uh, DPU is more targeted to software-defined networking than it is to software-defined storage. At least that's our understanding based on uh, the information we could, we could find. And then I think the, the last uh, example is a fungible uh, DPU. Uh, I think fungible is quite interesting because we share a lot of, uh, uh, let's say, we, we think we share the same vision of the market. Uh, basically, they also have a many core uh, processor. So, and they, they also have a strategy to kind of disrupt the, the storage uh, industry, uh, which is pretty in line with ours. And I have seen, as I said uh, at the beginning of this presentation, I think Intel has uh, uh, announced a, a DPU uh, today, but uh, I could not check all the details yet. Also, Pensando as a DPU. For yeah, you. yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, Pensado is a good example. Uh, just uh, there is not much uh, information on the on the hardware. I mean, it's not very easy to find details. Uh, it seems that it's more a kind of. Uh, 
configurable NIC because you program it using P4 programming language. It's well, P4 for us is more a configuration language more than a, a programmable programming language. So it seems in terms of programmability, uh, it seems to be less programmable uh, than our solutions. That's our analysis at least. Thank you. Uh, if there is no further question, I can let the hand to Loic. Yeah, thank you. So we are, I think we are running late, but uh, I think as soon as there we are letting actually, the te technical sorry. people to talk before you. There, there is one question in the chat. Sure. This is from Mary Bransko. Um, once you finish the landscape discussion, can you cover the ease of programmability? The problem with SmartNIC and DPU before has been how few organizations have the expertise to program them for their needs. Are you able to make this accessible to a wider, a wider audience or do you have a narrow focus? No, I think definitely that thanks to our approach of using, uh, at least for storage, uh, of uh, using SPDK as a framework, uh, we think we can really open uh, our DPU to the programmation of uh, any storage developer, basically. So anybody who has SPDK uh, knowledge will uh, be able to uh, do some programming on our DPU uh, pretty easily with a very uh, uh, quick ramping, uh, ramping up. Okay, so, so maybe, I mean, shall we move on so that we can show you a concrete example, video and so on. Uh, um, uh, we, I mean, Loic uh, was, um, uh, prepare an overview about the market. Uh, I don't know how much uh, you want to spend time on market. So uh, maybe we can go very rapidly and then we, we may ask questions, if any. Yeah, so let's go very quickly. So uh, first with uh, sharing two vision, uh, companies that are sharing same vision on the need for acceleration card. So first is uh, Dell, Dell EMC, you know, that is uh, willing to address the revolution of the 5G. So moving from 4G to 5G, there is a lot of, uh, uh, architecture changes on the uh, network infrastructure. And, and the reason for that is because they need a lot of uh, compute, networking and storage infrastructure close to the antenna, close to where the data are generated. And that's the reason why, and this is a vision of this uh, gentleman, the fellow and VP of uh, the CTO office of, of Dell EMC, that they need some acceleration cards. So they will be used to accelerate either the radio or networking or uh, application and AI. But this is really the vision that we share. So obviously the biggest vision because they want to pro propose the servers, but I think definitely the way to address those needs in terms of performances per watt and per dollar is we to put uh, some acceleration cards and, and we, we share this view. The second view is, is a view from McKinsey. So the, the famous um, uh, consulting firm. Uh, so they are, they are uh, making a focus on the AI semiconductor. So today, um, the most of the AI semiconductor is sold on the data center side, so centralized way. Uh, it will double from now to, uh, from 2017 to 2025, but on the edge side, it will uh, be multiplied by probably uh, uh, 20, uh, uh, and this will be the big, big uh, uh, effort that will be done on the semiconductor AI. This will really be uh, booming on, on the edge side. So what you can see here on the right hand side is the data center centralized way. So what you can see is inference is done on CPU and it will be later accelerated on ASIC when we move forward. And training today, which is you know, how we build the model, is definitely 100% uh, done on GPUs today. And it will, be, uh, it will not be the case in the, in the year to come. And same, same for uh, the, the edge view, uh, so at the edge of the network. So today it's mainly done on CPU and, and you can see here clearly that it will migrate to ASIC platform, so dedicated platform acceleration. So definitely it's important to see that AI is not uh, standalone. I mean, when you need AI, you need as well networking, you need storage. So this means that on the data center and on the edge, there would be these needs for uh, acceleration and specific platform. So if we go specifically on, on the uh, data centers, so this is the, the topics of today, the two uh, next slide are you know, from the Omdia. So Omdia is a new name for the Informa OVUM and EHS market uh, um, uh, firm. So we are exploring two aspects, the programmable NIC 
and which is here in pink, the growth, growing, uh, the most growing uh, segment in terms of uh, NIC. You know, in blue you have the, the basic, uh, the basic NIC, and and uh, sorry, uh, you have the offload NIC, so the basic in blue and uh, and in purple, and and uh, the offload NIC in blue. So the, the the segment that is growing the most is definitely the programmable NIC. Why you need to pro pro programmable NIC? Because you need to offload the, the CPU, the, the main uh, x86, with, with all the protocols, and, and we need to be uh, completely programmable. So this is definitely uh, explaining, and the reason why we are going to go in the details of the need for new uh, type of processor, the one that DPUs that uh, uh, Seb and, and, and Eric just explained. So that's, I think, really important. And next slide and last slide from my side is on the storage. So there is as well a revolution with the SSDs and revolution with new protocols, but definitely to get the, you know, the most um, performances out of those storage system. And this is definitely where we are going to spend most of the time now is you need uh, you know new platform that will really, really uh, take, uh, get the best out of the SSD, the expensive SSD uh, with dedicated platform. And, and that's definitely what we're going to talk about. That's the blue segment here that we're addressing, which is called the performance uh, optimized, which is really a uh, whole flash array with, uh, with new protocols such as NVMe and NVMe over fabric. So that's what we are going to cover from now. Thank you. Thank you, Loic. So now really the point is to, to focus on the storage and to introduce first the, the product uh, based on what we believe are the challenges of this market. And I will let Remy, uh, sorry, uh, Seb uh, give uh, uh, more information uh, but we start with Jeff in terms of uh, career market and differentiation. And then we will run through the video uh, showing uh, one product that we co-developed with one of our partners. Uh, before going to seven use cases uh, about smart storage adapter. Jeff, the floor is yours. Yes, so Enrico, to your question, uh, we're gonna go into the details now. Uh, the next uh, sections are more technical about what features we have and when we build, when we build them, right? Um, <clears throat> so what is the challenge? Um, and what are, are we facing? We are facing that revolution of NVMe. Um, Sebastian explained really why DPUs, it's about parallelism. Uh, you're all aware about all legacy SCSI, um, first generation of SSDs embracing SAS, and now um, starting to embrace NVMe. And that's interesting that embracing NVMe, uh, SSD is pushing uh, the bottlenecks up, up the ladder. Um, for, for the many years, the, the, the bottleneck was uh, really the, the drives, um, and now we start to be the storage OS. And that's where we play. Uh, we want to be as as low as an impact in between SSDs and applications. That's why we, we are placing the game for disaggregation for, because for today, um, the adoption of NVMe SSDs has been from an e-commodity server because a new application can access those drives directly. And our aim is to, to, to push disaggregation for B2, B2CO better watt per dollar uh, with our storage appliances. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So here are the card. Um, into the details, exp uh, we, have, we have introduced the different components. Um, so um, we'll go into the details about the software implementation uh, a bit later. Um, it, it's about having control plane, data plane running on the same processor. The control plane will take control of the devices, will prepare the QIOs, and, and the data plane will execute the IOs um, and put the, the data blocks into those queues. Uh, <clears throat> what do we have? Obviously, you need management. So we have several, several ways of managing the, uh, the features. Um, every single core has Ethernet access. So every single Ethernet access will provide management. So we are, we are doing inbound management through the 100 gig uh, lines. We can do uh, low level management from a, the PCI perspective. And we have also, um, <clears throat> we have also gigabit management um, dedicated gigabit management for other purposes like smart NIC, which needs those uh, type of management. From a feature set perspective, obviously what you expect from a storage appliance is to provide basic uh, storage services and enhanced storage services. Um, first, first of all, is really to protect the car. So whenever you have multiple cards in the chassis, you have a high availability across the car. Then you need to protect the drives. So you expect 
rate type of things. So we are we have implemented Red Zero, Red One, and we are um, innovating with Red Six using uh, error coding uh, Red Solomon um, from uh, error coding type of algorithm um, to protect data. Um, so all managed by our cores because we have Red Solomon accelerators. <clears throat> so high availability from a card perspective, high availability from a drive perspective, and as well as other features. So everything which comes with SPDK will come along, um, and that's important. What it is important to notice as well is we don't need any x86 in the appliance. Uh, the card is standalone, uh, connect the drives and, and put the features on, and, and that's it, right? Let's go to the next slide because we have, we have the software features. So uh, as been explained before, um, <clears throat> this AT core processor has been divided in five sections. Those five sections are memory currents. On the right-hand side, you have the control plane. So we have an embedded Linux running uh, on which we can we run all the management, all the configuration, all the interfaces uh, when it comes to integrate into a Kubernetes in an open stack and all those things. This is managed by the Linux um, in the control plane. The data plane is made of four entities, uh, so 64 cores and so uh, as explained, those cores are running uh, uh, to completion. So uh, the description in how we, we handle the IO, and we have two stacks. Um, we have a, a TCP IP and UDP stack for the networking. Uh, yeah, you can go to the next slide. And a storage stack, uh, basically handling NVMe. So as you know, NVMe uh, is working on many protocols, right? You can have NVMe on PCI, you have an NVMe on TCP, you have NVMe uh, over uh, UDP or Rocky. Um, NVMe or public etc. et cetera. So here, what we have, we have NVMe for TCP and UDP, and we have NVMe over, over PCI. That's why we have two offerings. Um, if we, um, the card can manage directly the NVMe SSDs, and the card can promote NVMe IDs across a TCP IP or, or, or Rocky. Um, that's where you find SPDK. Um, globally, so SPDK control runs on the control plane. SPDK BDEVs are running on the data, data plane, and that's where we add services. That's where we can enhance. Um, and we have things that with some part with some customers says, hey, if you have SPDK, we, we see that nice features in SPDK. We love you to have that running on your data, data plane. Quite easy. We take the code, we compile it. It's running now. A, to make it a product, it, de it demands a bit of tuning, but it's, it's a very, um, very uh, short route to get something up and running in our car. Um, Just one question, uh, Jean-François. Uh, for, for performance for performance matters, do you need to, uh, to rewrite or rearrange the, the data pass through the clusters, yeah, yeah, making yeah. it uh, serial and not random, for example? Uh, Basically, for, for if you if you are talking about the SPDK part, uh, we 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 don't need. We can take the SPDK block device and modules that are being written by customers on x86 and uh, port it in our embedded uh, data plane SPDK. Not that for this data plane SPDK, we have ported SPDK on a dedicated light OS. It's not Linux running, so but it's transparent for all the the applications uh, view. Uh, for for the network side, we have our uh, own uh, TCP IP and rocket termination optimized uh, code running on uh, some cores. So uh, th there is no specific uh, customization. Uh, yeah, you, in fact, you don't need to realign uh, data serially or randomly to have the same performance. In fact, okay, this was just uh, and that my one, question. If you want more details? You can you can replay the. Uh, uh, SDC, uh, EMEA, uh, which happened last week, uh, and we gave with Remy a pitch explaining how we ported uh, SPDK on basically what we have invented here, and this is really innovation. It's like you have five processors. SPDK has been designed to run on one, and we have ported SPDK, or we have optimized SPDK to run on five instances, making happy um, lucky is one, right? So really interesting to see how we pass information and how we have we had a massive parallelism. Right? Well, thank you for the precision. Um, so it, it's important, yes, this is about that slide. 
Um, SPDK, is in, if you're aware of SPDK, this is really amazing how it treats IOPS uh, in a parallel way. So for us, it was obvious to use that stack. Um, we just use, as we, as we said, the regular SPDK, uh, modular block device, and it opens uh, perspective for customers and partners. Uh, obviously, we will come with built-in features, as I said, RAID, uh, compression, the duplication, and some others. Um, but if a, there's a specific need or something which has been developed by a customer on SPDK X86, we can easily port it here and have more features. So really open. It's more like your know, black box. It's an open box um, and re ready to, to add more services. Um, what we have developed is inter-cluster. So cluster is that small entity of 16 cores. Inter-cluster, very fast communication using RDMAs so that we can pass across shared memory uh, in a very efficient way. Uh, the, 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 the things between control plane, data plane, or the, the various, um, play, uh, the various uh, clusters. Next slide, please. Yes, so um, as I said, basic data services, enhanced data services, um, we, we have built in uh, algorithm uh, to implement um, um, the duplication, um, and uh, we, we can do compression as well. Uh, this is done by software, and we are working to get that done by hardware in the future. Um, we have a crypto accelerator, so it's easy for us, and this is part of our roadmap uh, to add encryption. Um, so end-to-end -end encryption, uh, or just um, while you write data, we can do that encryption as well. Um, so basically, you have all the features uh, we have and plan to have in the next coming months. Thank you, Jack. Uh, so I think it's time for for a demonstration. Uh, so we would like to run a, a two video actually, which are uh, uh, actually presenting uh, the first use case using our storage card. And this first use case is a use case of a storage array. I have a, I have a question. What happens if you know the card uh, breaks? I mean, and uh, I lose everything that is on the card. So how can I recover from that situation on my server? So um, we really uh, want to run. Yeah, the, so typically uh, we we have multipassing, so we are able to to use two cards uh, controlling uh, one SSD in dual port in mode, for example. But as soon as we have some uh, storage services like uh, logical volumes and with metadata. We save all, the, we synchronize all the metadata uh, on the section of the uh, SSD. We don't have yet on this version of the chip the, the support for non-volatile memory. This will be planned for the next generation, but for now we synchronize everything on a, a segment of the SSD. So which means that we can uh, fail over to another board and, uh, and recover all the metadata and make the process uh, uh, but you can lose some rights if you don't have any mechanism. Uh, no, we are currently working on a log write uh, implementation for the red uh, support. So we, we, we do things in such a way that we don't lose any rights. Hmm. So it's like NVRM uh, and Rico, um, but on SSD because we have so much power in backend. Um, that we can we can assume. Oh, but if you acknowledge the write before it reaches the SSD, yeah. that there is, there is a you know even if it's a corner case, you know you can lose a write. Yes, we can lose a write, but we, what we do. Oh, you can lose a write, not a write. A drive. Oh, right. I understand you can lose a drive, but if you lose a card, then you lose the entire system. If you know the, the you acknowledge the write before it reaches the. The, the SSD. Um, but then mm -hmm. if it's not, it has not reached the SSD, the IO is not completed, so it's a, it's it asked for retrial. Yeah, we, the point is that it's not acknowledged until it is completed. Yes. Yes. We, we, we don't have okay. the right as, uh, till it's not uh, safe in a section of the SSD. So, uh, of course. So you don't have any form of cache or anything on, on the, so only compute. And so you acknowledge the write when it reaches the SSD anyway. Yeah, yeah but the, the chip is going so fast that you can do this way. That's one of the key benefits, I think. So, but uh, I think the video will show you what we build and then the team will go into these details in terms of uh, latency and so on. 
Do you like me to play the video? Yes, please. Thank you, Lisa. This is Jean-François Marie. I'm here at Calray and I'm going to discuss about MDPA, our many core processor, our brand new k 200 lp the low profile card, and the brand new chassis we're going to come to um, uh, as a flash array. So let's get started with our processor. And this is our MBPA3, 10 years of R&D, 80 cores, fully programmable in C, low power, as low as 20 watts in operations, takes benefit of the highest speed interfaces, 200 gig Ethernet, PCI Gen 4, DDR4, ready to crunch data in a smart storage adapter. And here you go. This is a brand new low profile card, our smart storage adapter ready for storage, edge computing, security and networking, very flexible, programmable. It transcends data services without any x86. It takes benefit of high-speed interfaces such as PCI Gen 4, 2 times 100 gig gigabit Ethernet DDR4, and it can deliver more than 2 million IOPS, 12 gigabyte per second, and sustains 30 to 50 microsecond latency. And this is our flash array. Um, let me remove a flash drive in the front. Very easy, U.2 format, up swap, hot, uh, replaceable, very easy. And this is really the example of uh, a new generation of flash array powered by our smart storage adapter. Let's have a look in the back. Fully resilient, two I.O. modules, two power supply, uh, ensuring operation, even a failure. Um, as you can see, very easy to remove a, an I.O. module, and one can sustain the full power of the chassis, full speed, full IOPS, so fully resilient. Um, if we consider now the I.O. module, you can see here three PCI slots on the left-hand side, one card inserted already, um, one I.O. module um, is managed by a BMC um, so that we can have easy management from the outside. So let's remove one I.O. module and see what's in. Very easy to slide out, very easy uh, for the maintenance, very easy to remove the, the cover. Um, and inside, we can see um, plenty of room um, so that we can fit the different components. Um, and the back end, connectivity to the PCI fabric. In the middle, uh, the, the controller to make sure that we collect the sensors activity and three PCI slots in the front so that we can insert the cards. So let's insert cards in there, right? Three cards. It's interesting to see that this new generation of chassis can accommodate and uh, scale out one to three card in IO module, two to six car for the global chassis. The, those GPUs are ensuring a high resiliency uh, so that there's no uh, data uh, problem, right? Uh, full access to the data all the time, uh, to enhance the storage services without the help of any x86. This is an example of a flash array built in partnership with a large OEM. It's highly available, runs without any x86, with a great list of storage services, all powered by our Calray DPU. It offers a unique solution with the best performance, price, scale and openness ratio on the market. I have a question. So you developed this array based on uh, on your technology. Uh, what kind of data services can I expect from from the array? I mean, everybody in, in the enterprise world expect at least a snapshot, a remote replication, and a few other things. Do you provide them already? So um, <clears throat> in the in the plan, yes. Um, that's the beauty of SPDK. Um, you, you have RAID, you have logical volume, manage, logical volume management, thin provisioning, uh, snapshots, and clones. Those are the, uh, the first feature we are going to plan to get this year. Um, and we are looking after some other things, such as uh, distributed erasure coding across chassis. Um, um, so that you, know, you have a, a broader uh, use case uh, across, the, uh, across the fabric. Um, and we are also discussing fast copy between, between um, you know, when you split a clone, how to copy fast, not using the network, so not impacting uh, the result. Um, those are the features we, we have in the plan for now. So may, I, I, I may perhaps in terms of applications, um, what we foresee 
and we are really a good fit for HPC, um, scratch buffers, AI, and, and because we, we have the plugins, uh, you know, we have the CSI for, for Kubernetes and the plugin for OpenStack and other framework, we can address uh, those demanding uh, containers and VMs in terms of, of performance. This is not for now. The plan is not to address tier zero, like critical data, uh, to compete like uh, guys like uh, Dell EMC or HPE, uh, which having complex enterprise already uh, data, uh -huh. not yet. <clears throat> That's just answer your question, Enrico. Yeah. Um, we have, can we we have two more questions in the chat. Yes, we, uh, okay. uh, we will we'll address that um, in the next section if you can wait. But, and the answer is... Sorry, Jean-Francois, is that for both questions, the one from Simon and the one from Christophe? So this one from Christophe, uh, from Simon, are you working to be compatible with OCP hardware? Uh, we would be happy because this is just a, connect, a, a connectivity. Uh, yes, we have plans, um, not yet um, in the roadmap, but yeah, we, we are thinking about it. Thank you. And, the question, and the question from Christophe. Yeah, just answer it. Okay. Thank Do you want me to play the next demo? Yeah, please. I am very pleased to introduce to you the Calrec Composer. Um, it displays information such as health, performance, capacity, strengths from a series of flash arrays powered by Carl Ray Smart Storage Adapter. Let's have a quick look around. I am logged in at John, a storage admin. On the left hand side, you can see uh, shortcuts to performance and storage hardware settings and support with direct access to our support organization. Um, you can see here in the middle, um, health status from the installed flash arrays, storage capacity, what has been allocated, what is free, um, and a performance summary from all the installed components. At the bottom of the page, you can see uh, the configuration of the different arrays. Uh, three arrays with two, four, and six cars, all installed with 24 SSDs. Uh, what is interesting, if I'm moving my mouse around, uh, on any card, I can see its num name, its status, um, healthy. You can expect that because you have a green display. And I can do the same on any drive. I pick a drive here. You have the drive number. You have its status. Again, healthy, uh, green display. Uh, if uh, any problem, then obviously the, the color will change. Going now to the performance tab. I can see the arrays uh, with information such as health, capacity, and real-time performance. I can click on any one of them uh, to see what's in there. So let's do that. Um, I can see here four cars, four controllers managed by four DPUs. Um, KSSC stands here for CalRay Smart Storage Controller. Uh, you clearly see how much capacity each controller is managing and real-time IOPS. Let's continue digging in and let's pick one card. So you see uh, that card is managing six drives. Uh, no surprise here, a 24 SSD array with uh, four cards has six drives per card. So no surprise uh, what we see here. Again, uh, we display health for all the drives, each drive capacity, what has been allocated and real-time performance. Let's continue digging in. Let's pick one drive and see what's happening. Um, we are mon monitoring performance. Um, here, a nice summary of the, about the drive, uh, what has been allocated, etc., and the, the performance graph, real-time collection. If I move my mouse to that graphics, I can pick any point in time, and I have a summary of the performances displayed by, with that drive. So I can pick any drive, drill down, if I have a problem, try to figure out where the problem is. Let's go now to the storage tab. Very interesting here. Um, information displayed again. You have the capacity allocated, 
um, uh, volumes, uh, what has been assigned uh, to host, the number of volumes, the number of hosts. What is important for that tab, it's really the DPU power. This is all our managed services without any x86 again, right? Uh, volumes mean that we have logical volume management. This includes snapshots and clone. This is the beauty of SPDK. Um, and more services to come. You can see here what we have been working on already, uh, replication across data center to ensure better resiliency for uh, application services. Let's finish our quick tour today by exploring the hardware tab. This is an interesting display. Uh, this is bitmap oriented with colors. Colors are indicating performance. So if you want to have a quick look um, of the different things, um, this, this is really easy. Uh, you, you see uh, the cards and what performance they have. If I just move the mouse around, and for that card in that array, I have more than 2 million IOPS. For that drive here, I'm about 500 to 600K IOPS. And the color code is quite simple. So that's, again, very easy to see what's going on and, and to make a quick diagnostics. This is all for today. Uh, you have seen uh, the Calray Composer, our storage management single pane of glass. There's a lot more to come, so stay tuned. Okay, back to you guys. Okay, thank you very much, Lisa. So we back to the, I mean, uh, uh, back to the agenda. But maybe you have uh, additional questions uh, regarding this video you would like to, to shoot. There was there was one remaining question from Tony. Anthony, we answered Mary about the color uh, for the color blind person, and uh, that's a very good remark. And we will add that to our feature list so that um, number that we have color but we will have other type of recognition to see the differences for, for, for those type of person. It's actually an EU accessibility issue anyway, if you don't have it. Yeah, yeah okay. thanks for the feedback, guys. It's always interesting to take that into consideration. Uh, uh, okay, so so maybe let's go into the more detail about this uh, uh, storage array solution. So we let Seb uh, go through that. Seb, floor is yours. Yeah, okay, so um, let's continue. So uh, here are a few slides about, our, about the, the kind of uh, uh, storage appliance that can be built with our uh, storage card. Uh, so basically, um, thanks to our storage card, we think we can uh, make NVMe over fabric all flash arrays uh, that are scalable, that have the best IOPS per dollar uh, of the market. Uh, we are uh, basically providing a, a turnkey solution. So it's uh, either uh, for uh, OEMs to build their own flash arrays using our DPU card. Uh, so basically what, uh, uh, what Jean-Francois has shown in the video uh, is a turnkey solution that, that will eventually become a product. Uh, this will be announced soon. Uh, but basically it can also be used as a turnkey design uh, for other OEMs. Uh, of course, it has uh, high availability uh, features, and as we said already, uh, we we provide the SDK, so it's a, an open uh, flash array uh, which is open to programmation of storage services. So, as uh, Jean-François said, uh, we provide in our product offering we already support quite some storage services, so logical volumes, scene provisioning, uh, snapshotting, cloning. Uh, red, uh, zero red one and red six, which is on, on, on in preparation. Uh, so, and then of course, other storage services can be added either by us or by uh, partners or customers. Uh, so it's uh, this flash array that can be made with our card is uh, ultra fast. So it can support up to 12 mega IOPS with six cards. Uh, so up to 72 gigabytes per second. Uh, so it supports PCI Gen 4, which allows to use the, the latest high performance SSDs. 
Uh, it's low latency. So for Rocky, uh, we have a latency of 20 microseconds. And for TCP, we have a latency, an added latency of uh, 50 microseconds. Uh, we can put up to 24 uh, SSDs. So up to six cards and up to 24 SSDs uh, in the flash array. Uh, it's based on NVMe over fabric industry standard supporting both uh, Rocky transport and TCP uh, transport. Uh, we are certified uh, by IOL for NVMe over fabric. And uh, with all that, uh, we result in a 10 times better IOPS per dollar. So this is uh, uh, the KPI that we think makes sense to, to compare our solution with the other uh, market products. So it's easy to integrate and operate in any system. So we, we have some ongoing work with some partner to uh, have, uh, let's say, uh, uh, turnkey integration in uh, usual orchestration systems. So basically Kubernetes, uh, OpenStack, Red Hat OpenShift, uh, and I think um, uh, another that I don't uh, remind exactly the name, sorry about that. Um, it's of course very su suitable for um, SSD disaggre disaggregation use cases. Uh, so basically instead of having uh, SSDs in servers, they can be in a central storage pool. And then it's a kind of uh, uh, storage composition, on-demand storage composition. So you can build the server made of uh, uh, storage on demand. Uh, of course, it's also very suitable for um, high performance use cases, so parallel file system or uh, AI slash GPUs, GPU acceleration. And uh, we have the uh, Calrec Composer uh, product that allows to uh, basically configure the storage appliance, the cluster of storage appliance, and um, basically expose some uh, uh, storage pools to the orchestration stacks. So basically, I, I think we, we, we think we believe that our uh, key differentiator is that uh, uh, is in terms of uh, uh, the reductions in TCO uh, that it can bring. Uh, so you can optimize by up to 200% your, your storage usage. So this is based on, uh, uh, let's say, a comparison be between a, a storage pool based on our uh, flash array versus uh, local SSDs. Uh, with an assumption of uh, uh, an average of 30% usage of the local SSDs. And you get, of course, uh, with storage disaggregation, you also get uh, more flexibility because you can add capacity as you need. You can add performance as you need by either adding cards in the flash array or by adding more flash arrays. And you also get the best IOPS per dollar storage appliance of the market. So uh, we made uh, some comparison uh, in terms of uh, uh, both IOPS per watt and IOPS per dollar. So compared to, basically this is comparing uh, DPU, DPU based solution, of course, with Calares DPU uh, versus uh, let's say a legacy storage vendor solution. Uh, so basically uh, storage solution of the big storage vendors today. Uh, and also we did some comparisons with uh, NVMe over fabrical flash arrays based on uh, x86. Uh, and as you can see, if you look at the IOPS per dollar and the IOPS per watt, the calorie solution uh, is clearly uh, much better. So here we get some more uh, figures, a, a bit more details on the comparison. So mostly with the storage vendor solution. Uh, so as you can see on IOPS per dollar, uh, we will share those slides if you want to go uh, more into the details or if you have questions, I'm, I can answer. Just I'm trying to go to, to catch up with the time. Uh, so in terms of IOPS per dollar, uh, we, we have a, a very good uh, improvement factor. <laughs> I would say plus uh, 1,500%. Uh, same in IOPS per watt, it's, it's uh, still very impressive uh, difference. And also uh, in gigabyte per second per dollar, uh, we also get a, a huge improvement. Okay, so in terms of uh, vertical applications, uh, uh, which are really well suited to this uh, new generation of uh, all flash array. Uh, as I said, we have, of course, uh, HPC, uh, data analytics and databases, AI and deep learning, financial services, and uh, uh, I would say life science, like uh, uh, genomic applications, for example. 
And uh, last, I would say that uh, uh, we have very good support on its way, uh, again, with a, a partner we are working with uh, to integrate in all the very uh, standard environments of the data center today. Uh, so uh, bare metal slash containers, I would say, uh, so based on Kubernetes. Uh, or uh, Red Hat OpenShift, which is uh, Red Hat's version of Kubernetes. Um, we have uh, VM uh, virtualized environments so with uh, uh, OpenStack and VMware uh, and uh, HPC file system. So uh, we are working on uh, BGFS support and also IBM Spectrum scale uh, support. So we already have POCs ongoing uh, on those solutions. Uh, so uh, if you have uh, the following challenges, so if you need to run data intensive applications on, on premise, uh, if you need to reduce the overall cost of your infrastructure, uh, and if you need also to scale uh, your requirements uh, easily, uh, then uh, I think our flash array is uh, really the solution uh, to, to your problems, basically. So uh, again, this is the comparison between um, local SSDs on the left inside uh, the compute nodes. So this is really the use case local SSD disaggregation. Um, and on the right, we replace the local SSDs per uh, with, sorry, we, we replace them with a, a Calare Flashbox product. Uh, and uh, basically it gives a much better uh, TCO. Uh, it gives also uh, let's say uh, no waste of storage capacity. You can grow your storage and your compute independently. Uh, and, uh, and you also have still the uh, possibility to add even more storage services on the Flashbox. So I got a question on um, go to market and I'm not sure when you guys are gonna cover that because I'm quite confused about what the plan is right now for you guys. Um, we've been tracking you for quite some time. I'll do this again. Tracking you, and it, it was always going to go through with the OEMs work, right? You know, going work and, and, and design specification and offerings. This is a, you know, this is an, this is a direct play, and direct plays have <clears throat> sometimes a problem, especially if you're trying to get yourself into the OEMs. There's a conflict of interest here. So I'm a little confused about what you guys are doing um, and perhaps you can address that. Okay, so maybe I can, uh, I can answer this question. So just to, to make it clear, what we present here is the type of product that uh, our customers, so typically OEMs or ODM can design thanks to our technology. It depends that on our side, we decide basically to develop what we call a reference solution. That means that we decide to have uh, something which is pretty complete, fully certified, so that our customers back to OEM, ODMs can very, very easily leverage our technology and push on the market this type of product. Okay. We, while keeping the flexibility so that our customers, so the OEM and the ODM, they can extend, of course, the feature set of this product and customize it because you've seen that the solution is very flexible and it's very open. So in terms of go-to-market, really go-to-market is we provide our complete software plus cards to large OEMs and ODMs, and that's what we're doing right now. Okay. And of course, so, so they are right now developing some products and we actually shown one of, one of them and in the video. And that's basically the type of uh, uh, KPIs that we have measured with, with our customers. And these are the type of products that they will announce and put on the market very soon. Thank you. You're welcome. Which is which is relatively uh, typical on the semiconductor uh, business, right? I mean, you provide uh, chip, but as well, you provide more sophisticated boards and, and sometimes reference design to our customers, especially when you come with new technologies. Sebastian, do you want to move to the second example? So, can I? Ask another question, course, and, uh, uh, especially uh, around VMware support here. I mean, you, you, nobody is really interested in SAN anymore. I mean, very, very few vertical use cases. Why are not you spending, investing in Project Monterey, for example? It, it, 
I mean, NVIDIA launched the Project Monterey with uh, VMware not long ago, so to integrate the DPUs in, in their stack, Pensando joined them, I think a few others did in the meantime. So that, that you know, there is much more uh, opportunities uh, in in that space than anything else. I mean, uh, I, I think Enrico, you are jumping to the next part of the presentation. <laughs> okay. So, but you're right. So, so yeah, definitely, this is a good use case. This is the traditional storage array use case, and then there is a second use case that we will present to you using this card, which is very close to what you just described. And, and basically, also, uh, when I said we support uh, uh, VMware, we are compatible with VMware, is because uh, VMware has announced NVMe over Fabric uh, support. So basically, uh, that's the power of using standards. Uh, uh, of course, some validation is needed, but uh, uh, it comes almost for free. Apart from the integration in VMware uh, orchestration tools. Okay, so uh, the, the, the next use, use case is uh, uh, basically um, uh, artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning. Uh, so on the left, you have the commodity server approach um, where you basically um, sorry, I'm, uh, I'm a bit confused by this slide, sorry. So basically the idea is to uh, use the uh, flashbox to have a common pool of storage uh, for AI. Uh, so basically uh, it removes the data silos uh, and also the duplication of data uh, that is uh, occurring with the current uh, uh, approach uh, for machine learning. And it also offers uh, the possibility to rebalance as uh, storage independently uh, versus compute. Okay. So thank you, Seb. So, so, uh, so we were, this use case one this, uh, was the storage array use case. And now let's let's go to the second use case we would like to share with you, which is a use case of smart storage adapter, uh, especially for storage virtualization. So, uh, Remy, do you want to take the floor? Mm -hmm. Remy? Yes, sorry. Yes, sorry, we are on mute. Okay. Uh, so in this uh, second use case, I will show you another usage of the smart storage uh, adapter. Uh, not in a, a root complex mode we, in a chassis, but inside the server in order to accelerate the, the virtualization of storage. Uh, what, what are the, 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 the main challenges that we have to face when we, we perform uh, storage virtualization in, uh, inside a, a server with many VM? First, the performance, of course. Uh, the, the legacy software-defined storage cannot match the NVMe SSD performance especially when you go through all the layer of hypervisor, Vertio layers, and, and so on. The, the, this, this layer consume around 25% on, on server CPU nowadays. We have the, to, to manage hardware, hardware independence. The, 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 there is a strong requirement to have the VM to be hardware agnostic and to allow live migration without a uh, dedicated and proprietary device driver inside the VM. So that's why we find a Vertio framework almost everywhere and is available in any uh, OS, including Windows or other OS. And last, the storage disaggregation. The, when we have the storage disaggregation, it should be transparent to VM. We should be able to, to, to migrate and to hide those uh, uh, configuration of NVMe over Fabric or iSCSI, to hide it from the, the VM. And if we are in a bare metal cloud environment, we don't have even this hypervisor to hide this disagreement yeah. complexity. So we, we have to, 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 to require, we have to provide, uh, to offload this uh, software device storage by a DPU that will allow to uh, access uh, VM to uh, allow VM to access the storage resources directly to have a high performance and to, uh, to have uh, the performance close to bare metal configuration. That's, that's uh, in this context that the, the, the smart storage adapter can be used. So 
basically, how do the, the, the card works when plugged inside a, a, a server? It's not more a root complex device that will uh, be standalone and enumerate SSD. It's an endpoint device that will be able to expose NVMe uh, resources. I, I mean, uh, we will uh, we will be able to uh, to be recognized as uh, NVMe, many uh, NVMe uh, controllers. And on the other end, we will take over control on local or some local NVMe devices using the PCI peer-to-peer -peer capabilities. And then we will be able to, uh, to control and to access the SSD without any uh, server involvement. So basically we will be able to uh, behave as a NVMe over fabric target when seen from the external world. This way we receive NVMe over fabric command and uh, access the local SSD uh, using uh, peer -to -peer, PCI peer-to-peer. -peer. Okay, we uh, also are able to uh, uh, receive NVMe command from the PCI. Uh, since we are exposed as a NVMe, a multiple NVMe controller, and then we can access either local NVMe SSDs uh, uh, with added storage services or remote NVMe uh, device using NVMe over fabric initiator functions. We are using the, the same uh, st software stack that we have uh, uh, described at the beginning, except that the, sorry, except that the, we had the NVMe emulation function in the SPDK data plane stack that we are able to, uh, to feed uh, using the PCI uh, interface instead of the network interface. So we are fully compliant. Just a slide just before I finish to. This one? We, we are fully uh, compliant in VME emulation. We are about to expose and to emulate up to 256 in VME controller, thanks to the PCI SRIOB features. We are about to take control of local NVMe SSD using the peer to peer. We can take control of remote SSD using the NVMe over fabric initiator and targets. And uh, same as the, 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 the target controller, we are able to provide data services like RAID, logical volumes, in provisioning, snapshot and cone and encryption. A, a typical example of uh, usage of the NVMe uh, inside a, a server with a ex hyper, Xen hypervisor because we are working with a, a a company called Betes that uh, maintained the XCPNG, uh, the Xen uh, cloud platform in the new generation. Uh, there is already a, a move toward the, the NVMe emulation using SPDK. SPDK v host NVMe is here to emulate NVMe to the guest VM, which means that the guest VM is able to, uh, to benefit from uh, any uh, NVMe of a fabric uh, in software based on standard NVMe uh, driver. That's much more efficient than the current Virtio uh, para virtualization driver. But this still consumes a lot of the, the hypervisor DOM0 or the KVM resources in case of the KVM. What we propose, what we choose this, is to move all this the host and VME offload in the smart storage adapter, which means that the smart storage adapter exposes NVMe functions, one per VM typically. And uh, then we have the PCI pass through to this NVMe uh, function. And then inside the CalRay smart storage adapter, we, we perform the NVMe over fabric transfer, all the, all the smart storage, uh, all the SDS stack and we are able to disaggregate storage uh, with no hypervisor uh, and no x86 resource consumed. And from the uh, VM point of view, we have local NVMe performance. There is no overhead uh, from the x86. Uh, okay. 
the, 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 we, we will see the, a typical use case of all this, uh, this uh, smart storage ad adapter in, uh, in initiator and VM emulation. I will let uh, Jeff to, to go very fast to this uh, HDI uh, configuration and limitation. Yes, obviously you, you will have this slide. And, and basically here, you're all aware when it comes to hyperconvergence and all those uh, software-led type of approach um, that there are bottlenecks when you move VMs around, um, when you have to you have um, um, data at, in one cluster and one node of the cluster, a VM running and the other node of the cluster. Um, so the animation is just explaining how we build a, a global data repository. So Eric, if you could move uh, to the slide so that we have time at the end. So uh, this is a global, the generic approach. Um, this is a generic like, like VMware cluster. Next slide, please. Um, if you create an application um, with local data um, based on the local drives, next slide, please. Um, and obviously when you move the application, the data resides at the same place. So you're gonna use the interconnect as a cluster interconnect to access that data. So you put pressure on the interconnect, you put pressure on the network and store stack. Next slide, please. Um, and obviously you need to relo relocate the data, uh, which puts again pressure on the interconnect. Next slide. Um, so those are the silos. Next slide, please. Uh, what we propose is to add a calorie card in each of those nodes, taking managing the internal drives and sharing those drives across a shared fabric. So that is a global repository for any single VM in the system. Next slide, please. So say you create a VM, local application, next slide, you move the VM, you don't care about, um, so this is for a generic and a VM EOF, right? Um, you, you still put pressure because, um, sorry, not yet a car record, I'm, I'm too fast here. Um, um, still sharing NVMe um, uh, storage um, on the hypervisor to take care of the data access. Next slide, please. Let's move to the Calway. Um, next, yeah, okay, let's, let's add a car record. We take, we offload completely the storage tag, the ERG coding, security, et cetera, across the board. So next slide. When you create a VM, you create data associated with it. When you move the VM, next slide, uh, obviously you do not use it. the cluster interconnect, but you use the data network. So there's no impact uh, in terms of access. The VM can access the data as if it were local. Um, and you don't need to move the data around back to where the VM has moved um, because you have that global data, data repository. So this is really the promise of, of that offload card is to take to manage local drives uh, to make them available to VMs in a very fast manner by having uh, just using NVMe uh, driver because it, it, it's an NVMe device. And because we also do NVMe OF, share that data across an NVMe OF fabric across the nodes. So we completely offload uh, the storage stack from the hypervisor. So this is really enable fun. customers to use cheaper computers. So instead of using most of today's software storage arrays or software enhanced, require very expensive, very high spec. By offloading into the DPU, we would be able to downsize the underlying x86 architecture and use something more uh, proactively priced, shall we say. Yes, that's correct. That's one option uh, to use uh, lighter CPUs. The other option is to have more VMs per CPU. Right. So you would say you would actually offload the storage functions inside. So instead of this idea of a storage server, and the VMs on a VM server and then leaning into the network and incurring the latency, even if it is NVMe over, over fiber channel, um, you're still saying, I would rather see a different approach to that and say, because I can do all the storage on my server because the CPUs aren't taken up, I can use my service for VMs and storage then. That's correct. Yeah. Here we are, so we, thank you, Jeff. So we we reach uh, the, the last part. Uh, so in terms of uh, just uh, just to conclude, so what you see is that so we um, we have reintroduced this new type of processor, and we believe this new type of processor is, is really a must to uh, to leverage uh, the later generation of NVMe SSDs. Uh, so I hope it was uh, it was interesting for you. And uh, now I think we, we can leverage the, the last minutes together so that we, we can answer your question. Do you have any question? Um, I have a, a broader question. Uh, I've seen a lot, like the DPU 
issue is I've got the DPU hardware. The question is, what do I do with it? And some companies have taken the approach of doing storage. Some companies like Pensando have tried to turn themselves into some sort of bit of everything and actually deliver nothing, but say they do everything. And then we're seeing companies like Mellanox and Video say that we're going to work with third parties to use our hardware as independent. Is it, would that view of the market be correct? It's sort of like a diversity of approaches the the idea that the DPU can be what you want, but the real values in the software of it that you use on it? Well, if I may, so, so I think, I mean, the reason why we're talking about DPU and uh, the reason why DPU is getting more, more momentum and traction is because I, basically there is a need for sure. You know, mm, yeah. launching data very, very fast in real time. So you can apply this need to storage. You can apply this need, you know, for in a car. So there is definitely a need. Okay. Uh, and, and so to answer your question, of course, uh, uh, the software will be very important uh, to resolve mm. uh, the use case. However, what we see is that uh, the hardware is, is architecture is really a must if you want to be able to extract uh, the value from the software. So three, what, yeah. I mean, what we've done on our side, we've been very, very innovative on the hardware side. Yeah, okay. and if you look at what I mean, the, the competition like Mellanox or, or or like Broadcom, that it's not so innovative because basically there's always the same approach, easy plus a couple of ARM. Okay. Yeah. But on the software side, we've tried to be as standard and non-innovative as possible. Okay. Right. I, I, I do, uh, and use a perspective. Okay. And then on the hardware side, you talked about VLIW. That's not something we normally see. Is that an architectural or a technology advantage? The fact that you're using VLIW X architectures. Of course, of course. So VLIW, I mean. It's, uh, very well known uh, uh, and very robust uh, architecture which has been, you know, introduced uh, on the market for, for many decades. Yeah. Uh, which actually, I mean, is the basis of typically of USB kind of you know, processors, so very very efficient for for, for uh, computing. Okay. And we believe that for the type of uh, application we run, which are very very compute intensive parallel tasks, this is the perfect architecture. So, so okay. yes, definitely running VLIW architecture is extremely efficient compared to. Uh, standard risk architecture. Yeah, because most people are just slapping some, you know, they're just relicensing ARM cores and putting 8, 16, 32 ARM cores on the NIC and saying, it's a feature that I'm using these standard NICs. I, 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 I'm using risk architecture CPUs. Whereas you're saying, no, no, we've architected our cards to accelerate based around VLIW technology. And you didn't seem to lean into that because I thought that was a standout advantage to me. Or is that just because I'm weird? I don't know. So, uh, so actually, I mean, uh, if you uh, and you may remember about five years ago, uh, is it chip uh, which has been acquired by Melanox, uh was announcing a 100 ARM core chip? Okay, uh, yeah, it never happened because I mean it, it would consume much more, much too much. Okay, so yeah. you really need to have a very optimized core to be able to to run the design. Mm. Okay. So if you want to have a mini core architecture like ours, I think that's the way to go because basically uh, VLIW cores, uh, let's say, put the burden on the compiler instead on, on the control logic inside the chips. So you, you, you end up with a uh, smaller core, uh, so you're able to fit more uh, on, the, on, the, on the die. Basically. Okay. Right. So smaller core also be more power efficient, I would assume, yeah. compared to an ARM core. But people who put arms, ARM CPUs on there get a branding advantage. Oh yes, we've got ARM CPUs and everybody just nods yeah. at you and it's doesn't ask you the sales. Yeah. You know. It's interesting what you say, Craig, because it, I think it was true. I mean, five years ago, everybody was talking about, oh, you don't have ARM core. Okay, I mean, uh, what to expect, right? Yeah. Uh, but with the introduction of new accelerator, AI accelerator, now the industry realized that if you want to be efficient, you need to use different type of architecture and different type of hardware. Right? Mm. So, so now I think the, the industry is very, very aligned with that. Uh, if you want to have efficient architecture, you need to innovate, but of course you need to make sure that it's easy to use. Yeah, I, I just it just strikes me that you've missed a trick by not emphasizing the power efficiency angle um, or the the architectural efficiency, but, but maybe you, you'd have that yeah, in maybe different- Maybe it was not stressed enough, you're right. Yeah. Definitely I mean, power efficiency is one of the key aspects. And what we say, I mean, if you look at our, our press release, I mean, really the key advantage is IOPS per watt per dollar. We believe that both in terms of dollar view total solution and in terms of, uh, of uh, power consumption, uh, this type yeah. of architecture uh, brings a huge benefit. Yeah, it does. Yeah, well, especially for certain type of customer for whom as customers move more to colos, right. uh, power per watt matters a lot more than it used to. And the the idea that you'll still run an on-prem cloud, but in a co-location facility is still an on-premise cloud and customers are increasingly turning away from public cloud or off-premise cloud 
back to on-prem because they understand the the value of that going forward so that's correct yes mm. Thank you.